Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continuing on our theme on Hindu uh, temples and architecture and uh, here as we have already covered some of the aspects of the early architecture building in, in the Hindu context, we have seen that how the rock cut structures as well as the structures which are made from individual blocks of stone or from brick they came into being and how they have already uh, started to address the complexity of the of the ritualistic practices as well as the philosophy uh, in, in Hinduism. Now, there are some of the other examples that we have here for and today we will be getting into the rock cut structures as well as the temples and the architecture building uh, uh, patronized by the Pallava kings in the state of Tamil Nadu today in southern India. So, what we have there that I mean there are particular two sites that we will be talking about today that is Mamallapuram and Kanjipuram. So, in Mamallapuram, Mal Mamallapuram being a port city which is situated by the Bay of Bengal which is around 40 kilometers from the city of Chennai today and there we see there are uh, a number of rock cut structures. So, that starting with um, a temple on the top of the hill to uh, there are those five very celebrated Ratha structures or the chariot like structures and then there is also a short temple. So, it is believed that there were more short and uh, this, this uh, such uh, temples like the short temple which were swept away uh, in the in the ocean. So, we see that I mean this is this is a particular site which is of high interest to all of us how this building activity that had flourished there between 7th and 8th centuries and those were patronized by the Pallavas. Now, the other thing that we find there is that how this particular site it was not really the capital city of the Pallavas, but this site was perhaps used as a place for different kind of experimentation. So, this is basically it is a space for different kind of artistic experimentations that we can imagine that had to taken place in the 7th and 8th centuries. So, the kind of experimentation we uh, still talk about today in the artist studios and in the workshops. So, Mamallapuram should also be uh, you know related to that kind of experiments if we think about it some 1200 or 1300 years back. Now, what happened in Mamallapuram? So, in Mamallapuram we see that there have been those rock structures, sandstone structures and then this ones the sculptors and the architects they have carved this magnificent structures and they have made the temple like forms as well as uh, reliefs and so on. And here we have on screen uh, the, the five Ratha temples and this Ratha temples being very important as we know that they are the ones they sort of like I mean show some of the early uh, developments in southern Indian um, art and early developments of southern Indian temple structures, the Hindu temple structures. Now, what are, what are some of the uh, you know what are, what are some of the um, traits or the features that we see there. So, I will start with this structure here and which which look very uh, similar to the kind of um, you know the, the temple structures that we see today and in which we find that this this particular uh, you know this the this temple the main temple is called Vimana and uh, in this Vimana what we have here is that uh, there is also this entrance porch which we have already addressed that I mean how there needs to be an entrance porch for the devotees to approach the temple and on the top of the temple we have this very elaborately made uh, you know the shikhara. So, here what we have uh, that I mean there is a pyramidal roof. So, uh, if we think about the, the roofs we have seen in um, you know in Bhubaneswar 
structure and so on there is this uh, you know uh, the, the roof we we see that that is slightly different from this this pyramidal roof that we have here and here again we have the vertical divisions but the vertical divisions uh, you know this this parallel uh, panels that that we have here they are much more distinctive than than the ones that we have uh, seen in the northern indian temples or the central indian ones and here on the top of the vertical i mean sorry in the in this horizontal registers that that we have here we see that there are those individual uh, you know units which look like uh, a barrel roofed temple form so all those forms and then here we have this uh, you know this this particular forms here as well so the replication of this temple like form or the shikara or the superstructure at that on the top of the superstructure this this idea of multiplication and replications that already we have studied so far is also here in this temple as well and apart from this what we also see in the body of this temple are there are those vertical projections which sort of like i mean come out of the main uh, structure of the temple and then there are elaborate carvings so the carvings can have usually in this vertical projections we have that individual figures who are carved individual or figures in groups and most of these carvings they shows uh, you know the deities they are either part of a narrative or they are as uh, you know granting boon or reassuring the devotees so this this kind of structures are are there and then these sculptures are sort of like carved out of the structures here now on the top of this here we do not really see an amalaka stone but this is this copula like structure that we find which is also called as stupika and stupika is something that we can understand that this also resembles the buddhist stupas so it's not necessary that i mean we have to think that whether it came from the buddhist practices or not but one can imagine that this kind of this stup or like i mean this particular piled like form is not only just there in the buddhist practice but it had already been there as we have seen very briefly in our um, you know discussion on the burial practices in southern india where we see that i mean there are those men hill like forms or uh, you know uh, the the stone structures which are erected vertically for uh, marking a sacred space so it can be a a much more sophisticated and polished form of that as well so but in a way that i mean we know that how this particular this piled up form or which which has a vertical growth that marks a space which is sacred which is divine and that is the reason we see that all these elements are there represented in this particular temple which is also known as the dharmaraja temple or the temple which is dedicated to dharmaraja yudhishthira now the other temple that we find here very interesting that is this bhima bhima ratha and uh, in this one we have this barrel roof so the barrel roof is something we find this long rectangular kind of this barrel roof and this barrel roof also has this chaitya like opening the chaitya the trifoil arch that we have already studied in the buddhist context we have already seen that how this form got prominence in many uh, sites not only in bihar and part of northern india but also was there in the deccan for example in maharashtra and so on so similar to that form that we have studied in karla and vaja caves and so on so this trifoil arch motif is here as well and is, you can see that i mean there are those bracket like forms those are added here as well and as i have already mentioned that i mean they are uh, you know they, they they bear the um, the you know the resemblance to to the earlier wooden structures which might have looked like that so this barrel roof structure we will also see that i mean this this structure is very important uh, in the later architectural um, planning in southern india
Now, apart from that we have another important structure and that is this particular ratha which is small in shape, but really relevant and this is the Draupadi ratha and which has uh, again a pyramidal roof and on the top of that there must have been a copula. And so, if this is the another structure that we find and this is a uh, you know temple which is dedicated to the great goddess and uh, this form it actually resembles a hut like structure and a hut like structures we have already um, addressed in, in, in our discussions on Buddhism and so on how the asceticism and monasticism they have something to do with the hut like structures. But this particular kind of hut like structures are not really uh, commonly found in the, in, the, in the Hindu context. As I have said that I mean if uh, in the Buddhist context we have seen that how the structures are made for communal use and then uh, those are the ones which are made as monasteries or uh, you know prayer halls and so on. And as opposed to that in the in the Hindu belief we see that the structures are built from these two ideas. One is prasada which is the royal palace and then the other one is the womb chamber which is the most the most important part of the temple where the deity figures are kept. So, this hut like structure we do not really find to be uh, commonly used in the uh, you know in the Hindu temples, but only we will be seeing this particular kind of structure in uh, different uh, pockets of the Indian subcontinent. For example, in Bengal we find that how the terracotta temples at least the ones we have them to be existing from 16th, 17th century and so on, they also display this hut like form, but nowhere else we find that. Now, this, this particular structure since we see that this is one space, this is one place in which there are multiple kind of architecture building that we have here. So, that is the reason this place is considered a very important site to understand the different ways in which architecture was perceived during this time and how these different ways of architecture building had also made a, a deep impact on the South Indian temple uh, you know constructions in the later times. So, that is also the reasons why we find that I mean for, for this Ratha uh, structures and the other temples this is considered as a UNESCO world heritage site. And of course, I mean apart from this structures we also have freestanding the elephant and the lion figures who uh, seem to paying their homage to the to the deities in the temples. So, from there, there is this another great panel that we find there in Mamallapuram, which makes this site absolutely uh, stunning and uh, very important as well. And so, this is this is a particular uh, stone that we find that there was already this huge living rock structure which was there in the site. And then there was a uh, you know there there was a recess in this particular rock structure. Perhaps it was made by a, a water channel. So, the water channel is certainly was not there when this rock was selected for this cultural activity. However, this particular recessed area which appears like a river. So, that was utilized by the sculptors and the artisans at this uh, in at this site and they have made that they have transformed this living rock into the story of the descent of Ganges onto the earth. So, this particular recess this area that became a symbol of the river Ganges and river Ganges from the very early times we find that I mean river Ganges even though it flows in northern India that is considered to be one of the most sacred rivers in the Indian subcontinent alongside river Godavari, Kaveri, Narmada and so on. So, those are the reasons why we find that the idea of the descent of Ganges which had been discussed in the Hindu mythologies that uh, has been featured with all uh, its its um, you know all its grandeur and with all the possible details that can be featured here. Now, what we have here that I mean how there are so many different things which are associated with it that there are the flying uh, the celestial figures, the figures with halo uh, on the back of their head that shows the divinity of them and this flying figures the kind of gestures they have we have already discussed them in the context of Elora and so on that how they are not walking, but they are flying. So, that is something that is shown in their gesture. 
so this this kind of flying figures that we see that all of them they flock towards the river Ganges and that is here and there is no other uh, you know the, there is no personification of the river here so for example in the hindu belief we also find that how river ganges is uh, personified as the mother goddess figure but th that she is not featured here as the mother goddess however we see that there is a naga figure there is a hooded snake and this composite figure who's flowing here so it suggests that i mean this particular area is actually water and beneath the water there is the kingdom of the nagas and the other um, you know this this um, the creatures who do not inhabit the earth where they sort of like i mean inhabit in in the water right so that is that is a way in which this particular area is uh, marked as water and that is different from the areas around it like here and here so apart from that what we also see that i mean there are different kind of activities those are taking place so this particular figure here as we can see there is a um, oh there is a man whom we find that is that is performing a tapasya or penance and then uh, he is considered here as Bhagiratha and the Bhagiratha someone who is um, you know who considered to be responsible for bringing um, the river Ganges to the earth and here we have the mighty figure of uh, Lord Shiva and then there are other um, figures who, who sort of accompany him. Here we also have a structure of a temple which gives us a sense of how the simple forms of the temples existed during that time period and here we see this tupika like structure on the top of it and then of course this is a simple cell here. So, these are all these different kind of expression that not only just talk about uh, the mytholo mythologies in Hinduism, but also gives us a sense of how the sculptors and the artisans in the 7th century, 8th century Mamallapuram, they have seen the world and they have represented their contemporary activities around it. Now all these great details that we have in this panel, they are matched by these mighty elephants. So in a way this is a fantastic visual strategy, it is an ingenious visual strategy in which we find that how the all those narrative details and everything, if there were more narrative details, the narrative that we have on the upper register and the um, left side of the screen that might have gone lost. So to balance those narrative details, all those minute things, we see that the sculptors and the artisans, they have made a very conscious choice of depicting this mighty elephants here. This huge, the form of these elephants, they match the balance or they complement all those intricate details. And the, if we see the, uh, in which the elephants are carved and not only just the elephant, but all the other bodies are carved, they are carved with high naturalism, the skin is uh, carved very smoothly and then with all the possible details with all the swellings of the muscles and everything else so almost they are brought into life now very close to this particular this uh, panel which is also called gangavatarana or the descent of ganges here we also have another uh, uh, sculpture that is shown here in the right side of the screen which is called the monkey family and this monkey family which is also one of my favorite this is something where we find that there are those three monkeys there is the mother monkey and then there is the baby and then there is perhaps the father monkey and what we have here is there is it's a family of the monkeys that we have and how the mother monkey is uh, you know caring for the baby and at the same time how the father monkey is perhaps perhaps just like I mean taking out the leaks from uh, the mother monkey's head, something that we see to be um, associated with monkeys all the time and that is also immortalized by, by this uh, sculpture here. And unlike the uh, treatment of the elephants that we see that is very smooth, here the structure of the monkey is very rough almost like I mean this uh, the furry uh, skin of the monkeys that they have been um, you know shown here and then like I mean the, the minimal details and everything that also adds to the uh, to this to this very animated quality of the entire uh, family that is represented.
Now the other things that we have here in this particular site of Mamallapuram is that there is this short temple as I have mentioned earlier that in the short temple we see there is a this is uh, perhaps I mean you know one can imagine that I mean how the uh, this this particular form that we have seen in the Dharmaraja Ratha that how this horizontal registers with this uh, the you know this tupika forms on the top of them and this high pyramidal roof that is something here uh, this all these things are been here uh, in much more in a uh, more prominent form and this tupika on the top of it and then on the top here we have the finial or the kalasha now another character and this this particular temple that we have the short temple this has two uh, garbhagrihas in one there is uh, lord shiva and the other one there is this anantashayana vishnu Another feature that we find uh, in this Pallava structures and that, that will be from the city of Kanchipuram which was the capital city of the Pallavas and there we have some of the mighty temples for example the one we have in the left side of the screen that comes from Vaikuntha Perumal temple and that is a temple that is dedicated to Lord Vishnu and here we have a typical uh, Pallava lion pillar. So, the lion pillar will be very different from the kind of ones we have spoken in uh, um, you know in the context of the Ashokan pillars and here what we have there are seated lions and those will form the base of the pillar and on the top of that the shaft sort of rises and then there is the capital. So, for example, the one we have on screen here and this became almost a very a typical representation of the Pallava pillars that we see there. Now, if we see that the other uh, developments in, in temple building and we will be coming back to the Kailashnathar temple which we have uh, partly addressed in the uh, earlier module about its paintings and if we now see the, the kind of the development in terms of its, its ground plan and its iconographic programmatic then we see that there are certain things that uh, suggest that how this making of the temple, the temple architecture got more and more uh, complicated with time. So, here what we have that I mean this is the uh, main sanctum sanctorum of the Kailashnatha temple which houses this lingam and which you can see that I mean this is still this, uh, this square structure and then the center of it there is the Shiva lingam. So, which goes with the ground plan that we have studied and then how there are more sort of like I mean sort of projections and more uh, additions to this temple proper those were not present earlier. So, between the temple here like from the Garvagriha and then if this is the place we can imagine as this ceremonial hall or the mandapa and then there will be also like Ardha mandapa, maha mandapa like the entrance porch and then like I mean how it opens into the, the main mandapa. So, this is basically it is a pillared hall which is covered and there are stairways through which one can enter this place and between the Garvagriha and mandapa there is this narrow uh, space which is called Antarala and this is a place in which we find that I mean how the mandapa is made for ceremonial purposes for rituals and so on and from there when one approaches that the Garvagriha then they have to go through this narrow space so that it is not really like too many people can actually go inside. So, since Garvagriha is usually considered to be the space of seclusion where a devotee has their one to one conversation with the gods and goddesses that is the reason there is this narrow space through which like not too many people can go inside it. And of course, as I have said that I mean by this time perhaps the devotees would be allowed only until this point only until this point and not entirely in the Garvagriha. Now, the other thing that we also find that how this idea of the circumambulation that gave uh, that uh, you know around the temple that I mean keeping the right shoulder towards the temple and circumambulating it something that we have already seen in the Buddhist practices as well that gave rise to having this the wall which sort of like I mean the enclosure wall around the temple. So, we see that I mean there is this enclosure wall which marks this sacred space, but it also sort of gives a uh, opportunity for the devotees to circumambulate the entire space here like this. 
So, this is how we find that how the, uh, the ideas about circumambulation, paying homage and respect to the deities and so on, that also made a huge deal of impact on uh, how the architecture is constructed. So, from there if we see some of the uh, ways in which the iconography had also developed and something I have already suggested that uh, if in the um, uh, in the Vaishnava iconography or in the people who, who give prominence to the images of Vishnu or like I mean to uh, people who uh, give prominence to the figure of Vishnu, then uh, they, they will consider Vishnu to be the supreme um, you know deity in the entire universe for the Hindus. And then uh, if we see that I mean what, what happens for the Shaiva uh, worshippers. So, here we see that I mean how this iconography had shown that the, the Shiva being the, the prime deity of the universe, the supreme one. And this is a very particular figure that we find that is called Lingod Bhava Murti and in which we have the Shiva Linga from which Shiva had appeared. And then there is a story that how um, the Vishnu and Brahma, they have tried to find the, the base and the top of this particular, um, you know, this uh, fire, the a column of fire, which which also later on that that became the Shiva Linga. So, this entire story that. Um, you know, praises Shiva and also explains that I mean, why uh, Lord Brahma is not worshipped in the Hindu temples, but also what what we have here that I mean this this also shows how all these uh, mythological stories and the narratives and everything else they have developed here so and then how all these stories they also relate to uh, you know they also relate to the Hindu philosophy or at least like the Shaiva philosophy. And as I have said that how Vaikuntha Perumal temple is also there in Kanchipuram. So, if this is a temple that is dedicated to Kailash Natha or the or Shiva, Lord Shiva and then the other temple Vaikuntha Perumal and that, that is dedicated to Lord Vishnu. So, this both this uh, belief systems we see them being like side by side in the same uh, city. And of course, not to mention that uh, Kanchipuram is also known for um, Kamakshi Amman temple that is also uh, a manifestation of the great goddess. Now, here in this particular uh, sculptural in this exterior wall of this uh, temple that we see that these lion figures that we have already seen those um, you know the seated lion figures that they, they appear here in a much more dynamic fashion that this is not just seated lion figures, but they are jumping. So, th that is something that that shows that it is not only just the iconography and uh, you know the temple architecture that was being experimented with, but also also like how certain um, you know how certain forms or how certain motifs which were already been established and how the artisans and the sculptors during this time period they have also played with these forms further to make them much more dynamic to add to the um, you know the theatrical impact of this exterior walls of the temples. And this particular kind of this crouching, uh, this this line figures or this jumping line figures that we find them, they will be uh, more sort of stylized and they, they will be more emphasized in the sculptures and the pillars in the later times during the Chola period and also in the Vijayanagara and Nayaka period in southern India. Thank you.